discrete time martingale transforms. Actually, before we get to the discrete time ones, let me just remind you about continuous time martingale transforms. We've considered these already. This is where you have a martingale xt and you form a stochastic integral like this. So yt is the integral up to as far as t of h dx, h being some other process. That's called a martingale transform of xt. Uh, perhaps a, a more illuminating way to write it is like this. Uh, in its differential form, dyt is ht dxt. That is, the, the increment of the y process between t and t plus delta t is the same as the corresponding increment of the x process, but multiplied up by some other factor, ht, which can vary with t and can also be random. That's the continuous time martingale transform, but it's worth separately considering the discrete time version, because this is something we'll also be looking at quite a lot, just as a discrete time thing. Let's say we've got processes xn and hn, so now they only depend on an integer n, uh, that is they're random sequences, not random functions. They're both processes that are adapted to some filtration fn, and the new process y will be given like this. yn will be, instead of a stochastic integral, will have the corresponding sum. It's the sum up as far as n. of the increments of x multiplied up by h. Or another way of writing it that is more informative, sort of analogous to the differential form in the continuous time case, would be to just write the differences. The increment of y from n minus 1 to n is The same as the increment of x, but multiplied up by h. So that's a discrete time martingale transform. What's it got to do with anything being a martingale? Notice I haven't mentioned here any, anything about any of these things being martingales. The key thing is that if x is a martingale, And so is y. And that's quite easy to see. Let's just do one of our one-line derivations of that. To check that something is a martingale, all you've got to do is work out what this is. Conditional on everything up to time n minus 1, what is the next step going to be? I'll write it in this form, and then what we're looking for is for this conditional expectation to be zero. That would be the martingale property. But yn, the increment of y, is just like this, so we can just write and then h. Now h was adapted to the filtration f. That means that hk minus 1 is measurable with respect to fk minus 1. Right? So at time k minus 1, you know that, I don't know why I'm calling it k, these are all n's. At time n minus 1, you know in particular the values of xn minus 1 and hn minus 1. So the hn minus 1 that appears here can be treated as a constant, taken out of the expectation in. And now the fact that x is a martingale means that this expectation is 0. And therefore the whole thing is 0. So this is a way of, if you've got a discrete time martingale, this is a way of making another discrete time martingale out of it by adjusting the sizes of the increments. Whatever martingale increment you had in the first place, you can just adjust it by multiplying by another random variable. 
And as long as that other random variable is something that is known at time k minus 1 here, then you've got yourself a new martingale. It's quite important that this is h uh, k minus 1 here. The thing you multiply by has to be known before this increment happens, not afterwards. Martingale transforms have a close connection to gambling strategies or trading and investing. And I've hinted at this before, but now seems like a good time to write this out more explicitly. So in discrete time, let's uh, say that xn is the price of something at time n. Uh, the price, for example, of a barrel of oil. So some commodity whose price is fluctuating randomly all the time. And the process xn will be assumed to be a martingale quite often. Why is that a reasonable thing to assume? That's a question that we'll be getting into a little bit later, but for now let's just make the assumption. Then the h that goes on, h, well, hn minus 1 is what appears in the martingale transform, so we'll, we'll stick to that. hn minus 1 is a quantity. So the number of barrels of oil. the quantity that you have between times n minus 1 and n. So you have to think of some trader who's constantly buying and selling barrels of oil. That's what he does all the time. Um, but since we're in discrete time, the only opportunities he has to buy and sell are at integer times. So in between n minus 1 and n, he's got some constant amount of barrels of oil that he's holding on to, perhaps to, to later sell. And then yn is going to be the trader's total wealth. How much money he has. Then what's the relationship between these things? yn is going to be yn minus 1, how much money he had before, plus however much he's managed to make or lose between times n minus 1 and n. And how much is that? It's how many barrels of oil he had multiplied by the change in the value per barrel. So if xn minus 1, sorry, if xn is greater than xn minus 1. This is a positive difference. The price of oil has gone up. And so if he's holding some barrels of oil over that interval, then his total wealth in the world will have increased by this amount. And similarly, if the price went down, then this difference is negative, then he's lost money on the oil that he's holding. But this is just the Martingale transform equation. So this says that yn is a martingale transform of xn. So what's the big conclusion we can draw from that? It is that if we've assumed xn to be a martingale in the first place, then that means that yn is a martingale too, and that tells us something about how uh, how much ability the trader has to make money. In particular, it tells us that in expectation, he can't make money. The expectation of a martingale is a co constant. Now, a key property here is that... Uh, this was hn minus 1 we used. And of course that's important because the number of barrels of oil that you have to hold between n minus 1 and n, that's something you have to decide at time n minus 1. And that is this coefficient here, hn minus 1, a 
according to the rules of um, being an, an adaptive process, that must be known at time n minus 1. It would be completely different if you could decide what your strategy was going to be, that is, you could decide this amount at time n after the price change has happened. Obviously, you would have a much greater ability to make money then because you could decide the size of the bet after the outcome of it was known. So the conclusion here is that if your underlying price process is a martingale, then you cannot, in expectation, make money, or for that matter, lose money either, um, just by having some trading strategy based on that price. This is something I've already said in less reputable language when I said that if you're gambling on a fair game, you know, martingale price kind of corresponds to this being a fair game, then you cannot, in expectation, make or lose money by any gambling strategy.